Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this WSO Global Policy Webinar today. A global call to action, increasing thrombectomy access and provision. Our moderator today is Professor Martin James, stroke physician and professor of stroke medicine in Exeter in the UK. And we have three eminent speakers, Professor Sheila Martins, Dr. Mark Rebo, and Professor Dilip Yavagal. Our webinar today will uh, last for an hour and 20 minutes. Each speaker will uh, present for 20 minutes. We will then have a 15 minute Q&A. The webinar will be recorded and available on the WSO website. Please post any questions to our um, panel in the Q&A function. So without further ado, over to you, Professor James. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, yes, I'm Martin James, stroke physician in the UK uh, and uh, clinical director of the National Stroke Audit, SNAP, in the UK. Uh, welcome to everybody. It's just past midday in the UK, British summertime. Uh, so I'm saying good morning to those of you to the west of me, um, including our three speakers who are all uh, with us from the Americas today. And I'm saying good afternoon or maybe even good evening to those of you to the east of us. And uh, who knows what sort of greeting uh, would be appropriate for those of you listening to the recording, maybe good night. Uh, thank you to the WSO for hosting this webinar. Thank you to the UK Stroke Association for taking the initiative for proposing and supporting its delivery. It is, of course, one of the hottest global topics in stroke, uh, not just uh, thrombectomy, but how to increase access for thrombectomy and the provision of thrombectomy uh, around the world. And the vital importance of this as an intervention is emphasized, of course, by the latest uh, World Health Organization non-communicable diseases best buys, which have recently been uh, adopted uh, by the um, WHO. And they now include both intravenous thrombolysis, uh, thrombectomy and organized stroke unit care as highly cost-effective interventions worldwide for reducing death and disability from stroke. Uh, so nothing could be uh, signaled as more important than that. And of course, in, the, in Europe, we've just seen the publication of an update from uh, the European Stroke Organization, looking at 46 European and Central Asian countries, uh, looking at the substantial significant variation that still exists in the delivery of thrombectomy uh, across high and middle income countries in uh, Europe and Central Asia. So the focus is not just on increasing thrombectomy, and we've got uh, Switzerland heading at Europe now with a thrombectomy rate of just shy of 20%, um, but not just delivering more thrombectomy, but eradicating variation in, in access and enabling that worldwide, everybody get ac gets access to this vitally important uh, treatment. And in order to promote the uptake, of this, we've got a stellar cast today. Uh, if we wanted to deal with the topic of the global uptake of thrombectomy, we couldn't think of a better uh, lineup than we have today. We've got Sheila Martins, our president of the WSO, Dilip Yabagal and Mark Rebo, and they will both be presenting, or each of them will be presenting for 20 minutes each before we have a Q&A session at the end of that. So before I hand over to these unparalleled experts for their sessions, uh, I'll just thank you again for joining us. We have over 600 registrations uh, for this session, so hopefully this will continue the big push for the uptake of thrombectomy. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you uh, Dr. Dilip Yavagal, who is Director of Interventional Neuroradiology and Clinical Professor of Neurology and Neurosurgery at the University of Miami and Jackson Memorial Hospitals, and of course the co-founder of the Society for Vascular and Interventional Neurology, and he's going to talk to us about understanding the global picture from policy to access. Over to you, Dilip. Thank you so much, James. Uh, uh, Professor James, uh, this is a, a real pleasure to present uh, at, at this uh, webinar. I wanted to thank Sarah Belson, the WSO, uh, Sheila, for inviting me to speak. Um, my topic today is uh, understanding the global thrombectomy picture from policy to access. 
Uh, I'm the uh, global chair for Mission Thrombectomy, um, the campaign initiated by uh, SVIN. And uh, uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I have consulting um, relationships. And, and I wanted to definitely thank uh, the sponsors that have supported Mission Thrombectomy. Uh, some uh, large part of the data I'm presenting is from Mission Thrombectomy research. Um, what I'd like to do in the next uh, 20 minutes is uh, really take you through the uh, well-known epidemiology of stroke, but call it the neglected pandemic. And I'll, uh, I'll uh, go through why uh, that, that, is, uh, that may be the case. And then talk about the thrombectomy gap that Professor uh, James just alluded to and uh, the um, global picture that uh, has been very uh, comprehensively uh, 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 published through our uh, empty glass study from Mission Thrombectomy, and then how uh, the data and the science of treatment access can help us develop um, empty access application approaches, uh, which is what Mission Thrombectomy has been using, and then how Mission Thrombectomy uh, as an approach, as a campaign, has been impacting global access to stroke therapy. So I would um, posit that uh, while we know the epidemiology of stroke well, we haven't quite brought it center stage to our, our, our uh, fellow citizens that it is uh, a pandemic. There's 13.7 uh, million strokes globally, 9.5 of them are uh, ischemic strokes every year, and they cause 5.2 million deaths and 116 million uh, healthy years of life lost every year. And the uh, real crushing uh, um, statistic is that 81% of all disability adjusted uh, uh, last years are in the low and middle income countries, as are 75% of all stroke related deaths. And this um, makes it a, 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 a heavy burden. But why I would uh, say it, it deserves the moniker of a neglected pandemic is because the COVID uh, pandemic that's now behind us caused 6 million deaths over two years, whereas uh, the stroke pandemic causes 5.2 million deaths every year. Finally, we have um, a, uh, a tool, a, a, a real weapon to um, impact this burden, to fight this uh, uh, global stroke burden, uh, especially as large vessel occlusion costs, uh, uh, large uh, uh, vessel occlusion leads to the majority of death and disability from stroke by um, uh, using um, the implementation of thrombectomy. We know that uh, since 2015, uh, thrombectomy uh, uh, as a reperfusion therapy leads to massive benef functional benefit and mortality benefit. And we can see uh, with, with uh, IV thrombolysis, uh, we have benefit, but uh, the, the uh, increase in benefit is, um, uh, is, is an enormous with thrombectomy for large vessel occlusions. What's more important, um, for the global implementation is that a, a treatment be cost effective. And we have not only studies from the uh, six landmark trials and um, um, resilient uh, from Brazil showing that the treatment is highly cost effective, but several other uh, studies, and this one is a simulation study from Saudi Arabia, clearly shows that implementation of thrombectomy can lead to cost savings of uh, hundreds of millions of dollars over the long term. However, not just in low and middle income countries, but all over there is a throm thrombectomy gap. And this is the case in the US also. Uh, I I'll go straight to uh, the more recent uh, number uh, that, that, uh, that was estimated in 2016. Uh, 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 <clears throat> the uh, number of thrombectomies we were performing were 20,000, and yet the uh, number of estimated LBOs are cl uh, closer to 200,000. And this thankfully has improved and I'll show you numbers. We are doing about 60,000 thrombectomies now, but we are still far away from the uh, 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 getting thrombectomy to the 200,000 large vessel occlusions that occur in the US. But if you um, now step back and look at the globe, 
and just uh, take an estimate of 10% of uh, all uh, uh, ischemic strokes being LVOs, which leads about, uh, this is an incorrect number, about 0. Uh, 0. 0.9 million uh, uh, LVOs. Um, the total uh, thrombectomies worldwide in 2020 were only about uh, 200,000, just over 200,000. And so we have a, a massive gap um, in uh, every country and globally. And this is due to the twin uh, barriers or twin requirements of, uh, of uh, thrombectomy. One is that the, the, um, the uh, outcomes are highly time sensitive and therefore the service has to be decentralized. And the second is that you really need a skilled workforce to implement this. So access to stroke intervention in the US itself in 2011 it was only 56%. And even as of 2018, only 63% of the US population had a one hour goal, uh, access to thrombectomy via ground and about 83% by, by air. But that um, really is a, uh, 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 a challenge that every region, every country, and globally we have to meet is to decentralize the services so that uh, each and every LVO patient can have the best outcome. In Europe, we know that on, on uh, 28 countries, this is a little old now, uh, 2019, did not reach the benchmark of one uh, comprehensive stroke center per 1 million um, inhabitants, a, a large number. And of course, the uh, uh, continent that we know has a lot, lot of low and middle income countries is uh, 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 even far behind. Um, the red, uh, which is no limited EVT is, is significant in, in Asia. Uh, limited EVT is the majority of uh, countries. And then the blue, which is uh, consistent EVT is only in, uh, seen in Japan, South Korea, uh, uh, Singapore, and uh, a, a couple of other small um, areas. And Af uh, the continent of Africa uh, certainly uh, we know is is um, e even farther behind, lacking um, uh, uh, even IV reperfusion therapy, and certainly thrombectomy um, we, we have uh, very spottily there. Therefore, we decided in um, uh, uh, mission thrombectomy. It was called mission thrombectomy 2020 plus uh, a couple of until a couple of months ago to do a comprehensive survey through our. Uh, through our regional committees to uh, uh, define for the first time um, in, in a uh, quantitative manner and a detailed manner, uh, what is the access to thrombectomy globally and, and what are the disparities? And this was published um, in circulation in uh, March online. Although we'd had data before that access to mechanical thrombectomy is suboptimal, we uh, did not have a, a global level data that was a comprehensive, and the, we didn't know the determinants of access in, in a in, in a rigorous manner. Uh, and so we decided to uh, do a global survey. Uh, we uh, had a specific aim to determine country-wise the empty access rate, the empty capacity, how many uh, centers and operators were available, the inequities, and estimate the gap. I'm going to go a little fast here just to define one rate. Uh, empty access rate was just defined as a proportion, number of annual empty procedures uh, uh, divided by the total number of annual estimated empty eligible LVOs uh, through the global burden of disease and uh, st statistics uh, 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 multiplied by 100. We had 80, 87 uh, survey responses from 67 countries. In the final cohort, we included 59 complete response, uh, six, sorry, 67 were included. And here are the numbers. We had a um, empty access rate globally that we found to be only 2.79% median. And this is, uh, this is a really a extremely low number, you'll agree, and this is as of uh, uh, 2020. The survey was done from uh, late 2019 uh, to, uh, to early 2020, and the, um, uh, this, the uh, low and middle income countries had less than half a percent access to thrombectomy as a median. Uh, upper middle income countries at 2.76%. And even high income countries had just about 20% access. The number of uh, empty operators available uh, were only 16% uh, globally median. Empty centers were 21%, so less than one in five um, 
availability uh, of, of the optimal. And the annual operator volume was only 10. And, and this, this is a number that uh, obviously is a statistical number, but the number of uh, uh, so, uh, thrombectomies done were actually quite small for every operator. And the annual op volume was only 22 for each center globally. Uh, uh, what we found was that uh, the uh, determinants on um, the um, uh, uh, of access were distributed again according to the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, income level of the country. And what was really striking are were the uh, 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 determinants that we got on um, um, a, 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 a multiple regression analysis. So, so first of all, the access, as you can see in red, is less than ten percent in most of the globe, and the disparity is even more staggering. The highest uh, access country is Australia uh, in our survey, 40, uh, 46%, whereas the lowest access country, excluding uh, the 10 countries that did not have any thrombectomy, the lowest access country is Bangladesh, and therefore the disparity is 460 times uh, between the highest access country and the lowest access country for a life-saving function-saving therapy. This is really something that is is very appalling, uh, but but I'll show you that this is not surprising. Uh, uh, the current operator availability and center availability has a similar staggering disparity around the globe. Again, uh, associated with the income level of the country, and as I said, the multivariate analysis showed us that, of course, income was the ma the the major de determinant. Uh, upper uh, and and the um, empty operator availability was a major determinant, uh, but EMS education on LVO stroke was a, a determinant that that uh, was statistically significant. But what was really um, uh, interesting to see is having a stroke protocol uh, to transfer to directly to an empty center was a determinant of access, as were cultural barriers and certainly empty center availability. But reimbursement did not really, uh, there was a trend uh, for, for um, um, reimbursement being associated, but it was not a statistically significant determinant of access. So several uh, modifiable determinants were found. What is really interesting is there is a whole science of treatment access that can be applied to uh, uh, mechanical thrombectomy access. And that's what a mission thrombectomy has been uh, working on since the last uh, seven years. We know from a paper from uh, 1964 that it could take uh, three to five decades for a new treatment to reach 50% access uh, from uh, EM Rogers. And the rate of uh, access actually depends on a number of things, per perceived attributes of the innovation, type of innovation decision, communication channels, marketing. And this is certainly very challenging for uh, medical therapies uh, because there is not the kind of commercial marketing. And this uh, rate of adoption uh, that can take decades, uh, we, we need to move it to the left. And this is even slower in developing countries. It could take up to five uh, decades for uh, thrombectomy if no proactive efforts are made. And the idea with uh, developing global implementation uh, is to move that, that curve to the left and uh, hopefully get the uh, adoption down to a decade or a decade and a half. What we do see, uh, I'm rushing a little bit for to keep my time, is that the number of thrombectomies have increased worldwide uh, from 79,000 in 2016 to 106,000 in 2017 to 156,000 in 2018. And uh, we had a goal when we uh, launched Mission Thrombectomy to get uh, to 202,000 thrombectomies by 2020. And they, that goal was uh, achieved by the, uh, by the uh, global community, 205,000. But you can see that this has actually started to now slow down to 2021, 240,000 thrombectomies. And these are preliminary numbers that, that I just got uh, from industry estimates, 250,000 thrombectomies in 2022. Uh, as I said, uh, the US did about 60,000. So between 21 and 20, uh, 22, if these numbers, the preliminary numbers are correct, we, we see uh, quite a bit of a slowdown. Uh, when a, uh, a, a global implementation uh, is thought of one of the tools that are 
very powerful to use our population level public health interventions. And these can be considered uh, for, a, uh, for a certain uh, treatment when there is a large health burden that's getting larger, which is stroke. The burden is distributed un un unfairly and it's highly, there is a highly effective and safe treatment and that is cost effective. Uh, and this uh, tool is basically an upstream strategy that affects, uh, that targets economic, political, and community factors. And so we uh, uh, have been working on public health interventions throughout the globe to attack the well-known uh, barriers to access, physical barriers, which are sent, uh, uh, thrombectomy centers and operators, uh, financial barriers, which are the reimbursements, and information barriers, the knowledge of what is LVO, how to triage LVO, and, and uh, uh, training uh, in, in LVO and its triage are, are the barriers. So three pillars of access that can be targeted by public health interventions, the information uh, pillar, the physical um, uh, infrastructure pillar, and the financial pillar. And based on these, um, a, a, uh, a global approach can be taken and therefore SVN announced uh, Mission Thrombectomy in 2016 to take on this challenge. And our vision was to have a global coalition initiated by our society that aims to accelerate worldwide access by integrating disparate knowledge of the barriers to empty access by unifying multiple efforts by local and specialty societies and each region to develop and implement high impact public health interventions. And our goal is to uh, double the access to thrombectomy every two years for the next decade. Uh, and, and this is not uh, easy. We have regional committees as our backbone, as the building blocks uh, of uh, this global effort. A regional committee is composed of a neurointerventional co-chair, a stroke co-chair, and a, uh, a liaison from mission thrombectomy, and then uh, uh, six to eight members that are distributed between the two specialties and a stroke coordinator and other valuable stakeholders. And we've had tremendous uh, progress and, and are very fortunate to have seen success since uh, 2016. I won't go through this whole uh, timeline with uh, our regional committees uh, now increasing to 105 regional committees. We have a, a horizontal uh, hub and spoke model. Uh, the core executive committee is in the US uh, with uh, advice from the global co-chairs from all uh, six continents. And the regional committees, as I said, are the building blocks where in every um, region that really are on the ground implementing the, uh, the um, a regional committee action plan, which includes white paper dissemination uh, and, and developing public health interventions and pursuing stroke center certification. And the workflow is through the structure. We published uh, a, a white paper for policymakers uh, uh, in 2020 called uh, Mechanical Thrombectomy for Acute Stroke, Building Stroke Thrombectomy Systems of Care in Your Region, Why and How. And this has been translated into 17 languages and released by uh, health ministers around the globe. And uh, this has really been a uh, tremendous uh, a policy success, one may say, uh, that we, we've had a uh, endorsement and, rec uh, and, and um, uh, attention paid by policymakers. We've had uh, each and every regional committee uh, uh, be, be a great partner. There are just some quick examples. The Pakistan Regional Committee has had um, a tremendous uh, prog progress with getting thrombectomy going in Pakistan and uh, uh, documenting their strategies uh, in publications. The uh, Caribbean region has uh, had tremendous leadership from several uh, uh, great leaders in uh, in in, in uh, mission thrombectomy, Dr. Julian Gordon Peru, Dr. Uh, Inova, and Reina Ten have been spearheading this and uh, analyzing the Caribbean region for both reperfusion uh, IVTPA as well as mechanical thrombectomy. And as I said, this number is now 105 uh, regional committees that have been implementing public health, developing and implementing public health interventions to increase access to thrombectomy. Uh, all over the world. We've um, um, had this progress uh, by having registry and research, by having collaborations, by pursuing education and training in LVO and thrombectomy uh, with, uh, as I said, the regional committees are our uh, backbone and then uh, continuous funding is of course needed. And, and then we've had uh, success with uh, 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 getting uh, endorsements from global health um, organizations, including the UN. And this has um, allowed us to 
to really pursue these strategies to increase uh, thrombectomy access. Uh, as as uh, Professor James mentioned, the WHO has recognized thrombectomy as a um, as a uh, uh, thrombectomy devices as a priority medical device, and that's a great success. And with uh, the public health interventions, uh, several of our regional committees have had tremendous growth in thrombectomies. China is a is a great example. Uh, 2020, they had 46,000 thrombectomies. Now we are they are at 75,000 thrombectomies as of 2022. The centers have increased from 1,075 to over 1,200. Uh, and so we, we see that. In, and then even Bangladesh, which is uh, point, had 1.1% 1 .1 access, has seen uh, 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 continuous growth in thrombectomies from 2019 to 2021. Uh, although small in numbers, the, the um, uh, percentage growth is significant. We plan to uh, continue um, the, uh, the research on epidemiology of thrombectomy access with empty glass 2.0. And here we would we will go into more details at, at the it, uh, infrastructure systems and reimbursements and at hospital levels to really give us a uh, very um, detailed picture. There is a uh, clearly this uh, coalition of um, multiple societies that are uh, needed, and we know that a higher stroke mortality there's higher stroke mortality in countries with lower expenditure and research and development, and this uh, can be changed to such a global. Coalition. So we are very fortunate to have uh, these alliances. And in conclusion, even after seven years of being established as a highly effective stroke treatment, the overall global access rate to thrombectomy uh, is extremely low. The disparity in empty access for large vessel occlusion stroke is nearly 500 fold across the world, uh, according to the empty glass study. And global health initiatives, uh, such as Mission Thrombectomy, which was formerly called Mission Thrombectomy 2020 Plus, uh, ANGELS, uh, the WSO's Implementation Task Force, can aim to address these inequities and gaps in access to thrombectomy and reperfusion therapy. Uh, multiple stakeholders, uh, uh, multiple stakeholder efforts in communication with policymakers can develop um, uh, access to, uh, can develop and build empty stroke systems of care. Uh, and accelerate access to thrombectomy. And public health interventions that are customized to a given country and region are very much needed on an ongoing basis to sustainably grow local access to thrombectomy. Uh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, your attention and I hope I kept, uh, kept the time. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dilip. Uh, and I think your presentation has illustrated the vital importance of uh, as you say, multi-stakeholder collaboration in implementing these policies. It cannot be led by any one single dimension. And it requires collaboration, including, of course, patient advocacy organizations worldwide. That's a fantastic uh, summary of, of where we've managed to get to over recent years. Moving on, um, I will um, just remind people that if they have questions for any of the speakers, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, rather than in the chat. Uh, the chat is free to, for you to use, um, but if you've got a question for any of our speakers, it needs to go in the Q&A and we'll curate a section at the end where we disperse the questions among our speakers. But without further ado, I'm going to move on to our uh, president of the World Stroke Organization, Sheila Martins, who is professor of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sol and head of neurology and neurosurgery at the Hospital Moinos de Vento in Brazil. And of course, uh, she's very well known worldwide, if only for being the principal investigator of the Resilient trial in Brazil, which was a landmark uh, trial in thrombectomy. And she's going to talk to us now about developing stroke systems of care for thrombectomy in low and middle income countries. Sheila, please. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here with this wonderful team to talk about this very important topic. Here are my disclosures. So um, we know that low and middle income countries represent 80% of the world population. Stroke is the first or second cause of death in most countries. And uh, 10 to 20% had strokes with less than 45 years old. We know what intervention at level one of evidence and need to be implemented in thrombectomy is one of them. 
Um, we evaluate in a service a survey with World Stroke Organization, World Health Organization through the world uh, to know the situation of stroke services in 84 countries, 318 hospitals, the majority in low and middle income countries. And you saw that the stroke units were present in 91% of high income countries hospitals evaluated in contrast with um, 18 percent of hospitals in low-income countries. Acute stroke treatments were offered for stroke in 60 percent of high-income countries hospitals compared to 26 percent of low-income countries. And only 50 percent of hospitals reported at least 50 percent of all recommended elements for acute care that should be implemented in stroke services, with most in high-income countries and upper uh, middle income countries. Um, for, for this study, we evaluate these services through World Stroke Organization Roadmap uh, as a start point to evaluate this structure. So minimal services were considered services without hyperfusion therapy, essential stroke centers, services with IV thrombolysis in acute stroke care, and advanced stroke services, services with mechanical thrombectomy. And the roadmap suggests elements and protocols that should be implemented uh, in each type of center. What you saw that uh, only 35 of uh, hospitals evaluated had the minimal required structure to be called a stroke center with hyperfusion therapy. So really is a terrible reality. This study in Brazil was so important to uh, we perform, led by Professor Norberto Cabral in four regions in Brazil, four different regions. During one year, we collect all stroke cases in the city, four cities, uh, to evaluate incidence, lethality, uh, and post-stroke functional status. What you we saw is stroke mortality in Joinville that had the first stroke unit in Brazil founded in 1997, first thrombolyzing, very well organized system with stroke units and all stroke treatments, including thrombolysis and thrombectomy, the mortality was 17%. The two cities without any stroke service, the mortality was 40 to 49%. We cannot uh, believe on this, we cannot uh, work with this in the country that has a national plan for the stroke, we really need to change this reality. And what the big challenges in the stroke care? The stroke awareness in general population is too low, untrained pre-hospital or pre-hospital not included in stroke network, few hospitals organized to assist stroke care, acute stroke care in low and middle income countries. Stroke services already implemented with partial implementation of the recommended protocols and structure, including the basic low cost protocol, protocols as swelling assessment, sugar, fever, and early mobilization. Lack of rehabilitation inside and outside of the hospital, lack of etiological investigation and evidence based secondary prevention, lack of national plans for stroke in public health and high cost of treatment. This is a huge gap too. So how to face these challenges to implement thrombectomy? So all uh, of us remember this year uh, in 2013 International Stroke Conference when we saw three negative clinical trials of thrombectomy. Uh, and since then the, the world started to organize and design best clinical trials with egg poise to show that treatment works. So after these, we had eight randomized clinical trials consistently demonstrated the benefits of mechanical thrombectomy. We had no doubt about this. Uh, but these studies were performed in high-income countries and had, have had minimal public health care impact in low and middle-income countries as um, Dilip showed. So in 2014 to 2015, we had five clinical trials showing the benefit. Since 2013, we were trying to convince the Minister of Health to perform a clinical trial in Brazil, in public health in Brazil, 
to show the evidence. When the trials were positive, we, we are ready to start our clinical trial in Brazil. Um, and we ask them to just run um, a registry to show that works because on this time we already have the evidence that thrombectomy works. And Minister of Health requests a clinical trial in public health in Brazil. What happened in our history in stroke care? After the approval of TPA in 1995 in this study, um, the First stroke unit was organized in Brazil in the first thrombolysis, but the TPA was approved to be used in the stroke by our national agency only 2001. And after this, the private hospitals start the organization to use TPA. In 2005, few public hospitals start the organization with local resource. In 2008, we had the opportunity to show to the Minister of Health that you already have 35 stroke centers organized as, uh, with uh, thrombolysis with good results. And for this, the Ministry of Health is st started a national project for the stroke together with us, with the specialists. And in 2012, we have the publication of national policy for the stroke with stroke units and approval of TPA now paid by the Ministry of Health. So we await 17 years after the NINS trial to approve TPA in uh, public health in Brazil. So uh, it was a landmark for us, changed a lot the situation in the country after the national policy. And for this, we asked to the Minister of Health in 2013 that the next step for organization of stroke care in Brazil would, uh, would be a clinical trial of thrombectomy because that time the thrombectomy was not proven yet. When the trials were approved, uh, we asked for a registry and Brazilian government deemed the cost of thrombectomy too high and its efficacy and cost effectiveness unproved in low and middle income countries in our reality because public system of care in Brazil uh, has limited the resources, 100% of population is covered. Why could be different? We have a more vulnerable population uh, more comorbidities, overcrowded emergency rooms, anxious suites shared with other specialities, and uh, only monoplane in Brazil, neurointerventionalists without experience in public health system, and few rehabilitation after discharge. And for this, we didn't know uh, if mechanical thrombectomy we would show the same efficacy and we would like to see the effectiveness and cost effective in effectiveness in Brazil. But the Ministry of Health agreed to fund a clinical trial to assess whether they should incorporate the treatment into the Brazilian universal public health care system for 200 million inhabitants. So we start the uh, resilient trial, me and Raul Nogueira as the PI, and a lot of people were very important in Brazil for this trial. And we need to rebuild the stroke system of care to implement thrombectomy in this country. So here was the meeting with the uh, resilient uh, and stroke uh, experts in Brazil planning what to do to implement thrombectomy in a, a low in, a middle income country. We start to use the join app, we disseminate in the, the country. Um, a telemedicine in our hand to evaluate the image in real time, to track the ambulance, to record the times, very good quality image to see CT, CTA, and connected the primary stroke center, the essential stroke centers, uh, together with the comprehensive stroke centers that would be the resilient uh, hospitals, and all them connected with experts, stroke neurologists, neurointerventionalists for in real time give advice about the case, about the vessel occlusion, uh, the size of um, stro acute stroke care, uh, the size of stroke in the image, and to help in the decision to include or not, and also the neurointerventionalists to give advice in difficult case uh, in the trial. 
and the specialists in anywhere here. We were in uh, Canada, in Montreal, in World Congress, and me and Raul Nogueira seen a case in Brazil for Resilient Try in 2018. Also, we implement uh, the pre-hospital evaluation for triage with a fast ED, showing the possibility of uh, low possibility of large vessel occlusion or high possibility used by the pre-hospital. If uh, high, high probability of large vessel occlusion, you can click here and see only the hospitals that are resilient hospital for uh, thrombectomy for the trial. And you can click in the hospital and summarize the case, the evaluation, and send the case to um, the hospital that would receive the patient to be prepared. This decreased the door uh, to needle time for thrombolysis and in in improve the door to puncture too. And we train one by one, you see I'm here in each ambulance, uh, training them, here was in Fortaleza, another site in Brazil, we train them uh, for pre-hospital care and to use the app. We reorganize the networks with the health managers to transfer these patients from primary to comprehensive uh, uh, stroke services, through SAMU, our national ambulance. And we really organize the full network in the whole country to implement thrombectomy with joint app uh, as telemedicine to connect the doctors inside the hospitals and to connect the doctors with the specialists outside and to connect the ambulance with the hospital too. We have donation for, we have money from the Ministry of Health for the trial, donation of device from uh, Meditronic and Penumbra and donation of um, perfusion software just to evaluate if you need to use this software to select these patients uh, from Brenomics and Schema View that were used only in 40% of patients. We train everybody, not only for the resilient protocol, but to assist acute stroke care, emergency physicians, radiologists, uh, neurologists, everybody trained again to, assi to better assist these patients and to decrease also door to needle time for thrombolysis. The neurointerventionalists were trained. Um, only one neurointerventionalist that participated in the trial had experience with penumbra, and uh, they were trained for to use um, solitaire and uh, stent retriever and to use penumbra. Here you can see how Nogueira trained all of them, and sometimes together in the procedure in the first time to train them. And we create a initial phase that uh, that that was a rolling phase that. All centers should include three to five patients before we start to randomize patients to evaluate the metrics and to evaluate um, the images, the selection. If they are not ready, if they were not good, uh, they were trained again and include more two cases to be evaluated before we start the randomization for the trial. So we need really a uh, very intensive training for neuroradiologists too. So the trial was uh, to evaluate the hypothesis that mechanical thrombectomy with the strain retriever or thrombospiration is superior to medical management alone in subjects presenting with acute large vessel occlusion until eight hours from symptom onset. 12 hospitals in Brazil with this distribution. And the trial stopped early for superiority with 220 patients, showing that thrombectomy is superior. You can see here uh, independence 35% in the thrombectomy arm, 20% uh, in the clinical treatment with adjusted odds rate to 2.3. We need to treat six, seven patients for one, uh, be independent, showing really that the treatment is effective. And very important too, we show that it's possible in overcrowded emergency rooms, in public health system of care, to have the same metrics of international trials. You can see resilient here, the door to needle time for thrombolysis was 34 minutes, 70% uh, of the patients receive thrombolysis when arrive in less than four and a half hours of symptoms onset. You can compare with other trials. 
also the door to puncture was 100 almost two hours but similar to others and uh, groin to hyperfusion 42 minutes very good to show showing that the tre the treatment is good the neuro interventionists were well trained for the trial and here core lab adjudicated tiki to be three 82 percent in the trial you can see comparing with others and really they were very good um, to open the vessel. So showing that it's possible to train and to qualify the doctors and the hospitals to a better acute care. And here, very important result too, we show that resilient Tiki, uh, sorry, uh, ranking five or six, uh, mortality or severe dependence was 31% in mechanical thrombectomy arm and 46% in the um, clinical arm. And you can compare with other, Hevascat in, in uh, Spain was similar, uh, 30% um, in the mechanical thrombectomy arm, but you can see pa patients don't treat it 46% mortality or severe disability, most than others. So showing that the treatment is very important to improve the, the quality of life of these patients too. The number need to treat for one less death or severe dependency uh, was seven too. So the conclusion disability was significantly decreased in patients treated with mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, with improved functional dependence uh, when compared to medical management alone. And the overwhelming efficacy of mechanical thrombectomy persists despite of many limitations encountered in the public healthcare system of a developing country as Brazil. Mechanical thrombectomy should be made available to many more patients globally. The trial was published in New England. We performed a cost-effectiveness study showing that is highly uh, cost-effective treatment in public health system, and we submitted a request for incorporation to the Minister of Health, uh, showing the results and the implementation plan for Brazil. And uh, the plan was publicated and approved in 2021. We have a delay in uh, to arrive in the hospitals because of the pandemic, but now we are better. So the previous trials showed that the treatment could be implemented for 20% of the world population who lives in high-income countries, and the resilient trial proved that the treatment can be implemented to 80% of world population who lives in low- and middle-income countries. Very important study, we compare patients treated in thrombectomy arm in rolling phase when, when the neuro interventions were starting, and in the trial, we saw that tiki to b 3 the recanalization was 68% in the early phase and 82% in the trial, showing that really the training is very, very, very important. And we are working together with uh, MT2020 to improve this in the world. What we are doing to, to have this in other parts in Latin America, we create a Latin American stroke ministerial meeting in 2018, putting together stroke specialists with representatives of the Ministry of Health. In this first time, selecting what the gaps and what the priorities in the region and signing the declaration of Gramado uh, with the commitment of governments to implement everything that's evidence-based for stroke. And since then, the countries in Latin America has using this as a guide to implement stroke care in the region, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation and uh, research. In 2020, uh, the second Latin American Stroke Ministerial Meeting shows a lot of improvement. You have two papers, in one in Lancet Neurology in 2019 and this one in Frontiers uh, in Neurology, showing a huge uh, improvement in the region, including implementation of mechanical thrombectomy since the ministerial meeting, mainly this one after resilient trial, uh, where we have a lot of representatives of ministers of health, including the Ministry of Health of Brazil. And since then, other countries start to implement mechanical thrombectomy in the region. 
We launched the implementation task force, but we know that the thrombectomy is not the first step. The implementation should occur from the bottom to the top, starting by stroke unit, that is the most powerful strategy in organization of, of uh, stroke care, decreasing mortality and functional dependency independent of um, uh, hyperfusion therapies because of the multidisciplinary team with basic, including basic uh, stroke care. We have in World Stroke Organization, uh, the roadmap, the World Stroke Organization online roadmap, the centers can evaluate the situation of the center and see what they need to implement to improve the situation in the same level and what they need to improve uh, for a superior level. We have uh, expert advice for implementation. We have more than 3,000 members in the World Stroke Organization that can help in different parts of the world. We have a strong educational platform launching now an acute stroke care in English, Spanish, and Portuguese to start. Uh, we are creating a new interventional fellowship facilitate uh, facilitating the training, strong training for doctors uh, in areas without formal training. We create a certification of stroke services, World Stroke Organization and Ibero-American Stroke Society during the pandemic. We have now 13 countries in Latin America and Caribbean participating to ensure that everything that is evidence-based is in, implemented in the hospital is starting with a platform to eva with a self-assessment tool to evaluate the situation of the hospital with mandatory elements that need to be implemented to receive a quality certification. And after we have an on-site visit. It's a partnership also with MT 2020 uh, and is uh, the certification has no cost to the hospitals, private and public, and we thanks to the sponsors for this. We visit the hospitals to audit the hospital, to audit the quality indicators registry, comparing um, with the medical records and evaluating the protocols, the team, and the material. Here you can see evaluating the material for mechanical thrombectomy, the CAT lab, and everything. And at the end, we have a board review to give the final certification, international one. We have 41 hospitals certified in nine countries in Latin America and 49 in process of certification in this region. And we identify gaps for mechanical thrombectomy. If for this, we launch a, a mechanical thrombectomy uh, training pathways after the certification to reinforce the training for neurointerventionalists, the pathways and the organization of everything with a, a neurointerventionalist on call one week for all cases and discussing cases with the doctors to see why the outcomes were not good. We already have this one. Here we can see discussing case training in simulation models and real case too. We launched the certification in India and now we are preparing to start in other countries in Asia and Middle East. We create the Global Stroke Alliance is the one very important step of implementation task force. We, the aim to stimulate a global alliance to improve stroke care worldwide and to discuss the best strategies for implementation putting together researchers, health professionals, health managers, scientific societies, private and public hospitals, industry and patients associations, including the Ministry of Health, discussing the best ways to implement stroke care. Here last year in Sao Paulo, we had more than 1,000 participants, 26 countries, the ministerial meeting in Latin America, 17 countries in the region, and seven ministers of health in person discussing the plans for the region. We will have an, a new one regional in Uruguay, together with the Minister of Health of Uruguay for the region, and one in India in September with uh, Asia and, and um, with India and Southeast Asian countries. We are working together with World Health Organization to launch a framework for acute coronary syndrome and stroke, where the World Health Organization will advise the ministers what they need to implement for acute care will be launched in our Congress in Toronto, World Stroke Congress in Toronto this year. And just to finish here, how to build, we built the
Thank you. We cannot hear Martin. Martin. Professor James, you're muted. Yeah, you are muted. I think he knows, so there might be something wrong. So I'll just take over for a second, uh, Martin. So thank you, Sheila. And uh, now we'll pass over to, to Mark uh, Rebo. And um, Mark, if you would like to share your uh, slides, and I will just give you a brief and introduction. So Mark is a neurologist and uh, in interventionalist from the Hospital Val de Bron in Barcelona. His research work is focused on telemedicine, pre-hospital and in-hospital workflows, aiming to shorten times and increase efficiency in acute stroke care. So without further ado, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Mark. I think I'm back online now. Sorry. Yes, you are. Thank you. So, so yeah, let's let's move forward. Uh, after this inspirational video from Sheila, what can I what can I say? Uh, I am here because I'm uh, like uh, uh, representing whole team in, in, in Catalonia, and uh, we are known uh, to be well organized for the last uh, over 20 years. And <clears throat> I'm going to tell you some, some uh, headlines and some concepts that uh, I think are useful. So first concept I always I always mention is, is the following. Not everything is a thrombectomy, and not all the decisions we're taking towards boosting and increasing thrombectomy <clears throat> are necessarily good for the others. So. It's good to keep that in mind. It's good to always to remember that all stroke patients benefit from uh, um, dedicated care in a stroke unit by a stroke team. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, it's good to remember that about one in four uh, will benefit from, from, from uh, thrombolysis. And it's a minority uh, that would finally benefit from, from thrombectomy and the vascular treatment. However, this is a very strong benefit but not all of them. What is the target in terms of, of thrombectomies? We spoke uh, earlier, I prefer to use uh, the indicator as uh, thrombectomies per million inhabitants, because according, depending on where we're practicing, if you're a primary stroke center or a, or a comprehensive, you have a lot of referrals or not, uh, the, the, the rate of, of thrombectomies among all strokes may vary. But if you speak on a populational level, the target in 2015, we used to say, and for many years I was using this figure, about 15, 20, best case scenario, 25 per 100,000, 250 per million inhabitants. If your comprehensive stroke center ultimately covers 1 million, we were supposed to achieve in an ideal situation 250 thrombectomies per year. Now this target moved and increased dramatically because now we are targeting more distal occlusion patients in later time windows, lower aspects. So just as an example, if we were only targeting in 2015, the proximal vessel occlusion, 9% nine, 9 of those would be, of all strokes would be M1 occlusion. Now we should have had most of the M2s, the M3s, the PCAs, the ACAs. So basically we are doubling our, our target. And now we should be speaking about 44 per million in some, according to some predictions. And all the scenarios in the future, as, as we've seen, but also in developed countries will dramatically increase. So I think the number to keep in mind is that in an ideal situation, we should be treating over 300 or 350 thrombectomies per million inhabitants. And I guess this is not happening anywhere so far. In order to do so, eh, we uh, know very well what happens in Catalonia. We have seven and a half to eight million inhabitants. And we know that we should have, according to European Stroke Organization, three stroke units per million, about one comprehensive stroke center per million. And 
And uh, I spoke about the ideal target in number of, of thrombectomies. Also, it's very important to have a very compartmented and a strict geographical organization. So EMS should know at any time where to transfer the, the, the patient with a suspected stroke and no losing time about in, in this decision. Either if it's a primary stroke center or a comprehensive, it should be very clearly geographically delimited for EMS. And we should work with EMS in order to do so. And as it was mentioned before, it is, it is a quality question and it brings a lot, even to large center like mine with a long experience, when we went through the certification, whatever it is through the WSO, in our case, it was in uh, through the European Stroke Organization, we learned, even us, we learned a lot about how to improve internally. And the same should happen with, with the physician, with an interventionist, they should be somehow certified, because this, this is not only a seal of, of quality, but it, it really brings, brings much for the patients. And the next concept I always mention is that if you want to improve what you are doing and anything in life, you should be able to measure it so we can find where are the bottlenecks you can find or, or uh, out if your interventions are changing and improving. And this, when we talk about stroke, it's called registries. In Catalonia, we have this wonderful tool, extremely helpful, that we call FICAT. It's the registry that is publicly open. Anyone that dials or, or types this, this, goes to this website, can find out uh, in an open benchmark all the centers in Catalonia, the 28 stroke centers, and you can see how our indicators. And for example, we know that seven years ago, just after the large thrombectomy trials were published positive, we find out that in Catalonia we're doing 382 thrombectomies. That is five or 50 per million, uh, <clears throat> quite low at that time. But we're gonna see what happened in the next years. And also we knew that all the comprehensive stroke centers were in Barcelona and your chance to receive a thrombectomy was, was like five times higher if you were uh, you were uh, in the city of Barcelona, so very unequal uh, uh, and unfair for these people living outside from the metropolitan area of Barcelona. And we needed to do something also because year after year we were improving our thrombectomy rates in the blue area, but the gap was constantly growing as compared to non-metropolitan or rural areas. And then we ask ourselves this, this question, how can we improve in rural areas? Should we continue or, or with our defensive strategy, uh, transferring patients to the closest center, or should we just bypass? Because it seems very logical that a thrombectomy patients might not benefit from an initial stop at the primary stroke centers. So we have these two options. We didn't know what to do. And according to that, and this is a critical question that you have to ask yourself in your own network. Here, you ask this web page to show you all the comprehensive stroke centers, and you draw a 30 minutes drive around them. And then you ask the, the same web page to show you all the primary stroke centers. And you see, most of these primary stroke centers are one block away, two minutes drive away from a comprehensive. And the question is, why should you drive a patient with a suspected severe stroke to a primary stroke center that is around the corner for a comprehensive? <clears throat> this is let me go fast here to this very recent publication from, from this month. And you can see here on a populational level in the United States, if you drive patients to the nearest hospital, uh, 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 the primary stroke center, and the difference in time if you drive them, if you bypass this nearest primary stroke center. So overall, you, you this is the difference in time. But then if you add the door in, door out time, so if you look for thrombolysis, for example, by bypassing, you are delaying uh, 15 minutes, right, if you bypass. But if you look for thrombectomy, you need to add the door in, door out time, and then uh, the benefit towards bypassing is great. <clears throat> but this is this is uh, uh, so this is very important, but many times <clears throat> there the, we have seen this publication showing that for patients who received a thrombectomy, bypassing the nearest hospital, so direct admission to a comprehensive stroke center obviously leads to shorter workflow times 
And this around 100 minutes means better outcomes for patients that were directly, directly transferred. But there's a caveat here, but here, because here we are only taking into account those patients that really needed a thrombectomy, that had a confirmed large vessel occlusion. And also we are probably comparing patients that are located in geographical areas next to a thrombectomy center with those which are located very far away. So it's not an even comparison. What we like to do, what we do, what we wanted to do in our in our network, and uh, because uh, we thought there was equipoise, we did a randomized trial eva evaluating both both options, and and the randomized trial took into account the fact that many patients that will receive IVTPA will recanalize in one hand, and also we are comparing here apples and apples. All patients were located in outside from the metropolitan area. So all of them could be potentially uh, transferred initially to a primary stroke center. We also included hemorrhages because at the pre-hospital level, we don't know. And we try to minimize the number of patients with mild strokes or without an LDO. And this is an, a, and the next key concept that I want to share with you. You need to use pre-hospital scales and work with your EMS in using them because this is the fundamental source where everything starts. And you want to activate as much as possible the code stroke, but with patients in which there is severe stroke, right? So we work with EMS and they use always the ray scale but you can use any of these pre-hospital scales. Those are simplified versions of the NIH. And each time there's a patient with a high probability of LDO, we activate the whole system. We call the stroke team that is on call for covering the whole territory. And we promote pre-hospital alert following a protocol in which we always give the receiving center the race so they know what to expect. Is this a severe stroke or a mild stroke and the estimated time of arrival. So you can have a good quality of the administration of time and expectations at the receiving center. Always follow this pre-hospital protocol based on the race score. And then you can make decision, qualified decision. And this qualified decision, usually it's better if you involve a stroke specialist with this information to decide if the patient should go to the closest or bypass the primary stroke center, which is closest, right? During the trial, we randomized patients to this and we initially activated the whole team also through these apps that allow that everybody at the same time knows what to expect, where is the patient, where, when he is going to arrive. And in parallel, we do all the paperwork before the patient arrives to the hospital. So when by the time the patient comes in, he can go straightly, not even to the ER. Most of the times we take the patient straight to the CT scan, or even if possible, more and more, direct transfer to the angio suite, where we can do the imaging in the angio suite and take all the decisions there. So because we didn't know what is best for the patient, Mothership or drip and ship, we randomize 1,400 patients, not those that are live in next to a comprehensive, but all those who live more than 30 minutes away from a comprehensive stroke center. And we find out that only by bypassing what you're doing, in fact, is you are in our network, we delayed more than one hour admission. And this means that only this fact precludes that you will give IVTPA to 10% of the patients because they will arrive outside of the window, the time window, the four and a half time windows to the comprehensive. And if this patient does not need a thrombectomy, you may be harming this patient by precluding or avoiding IVTPA. So keep that in mind. Long transfer will preclude or avoid IVTPA in patients that do not need a thrombectomy. This is especially relevant. Also, very important, we find out that long transfer of these patients, most of the times are saved. We don't need to intubate these patients during transfer time. And in our setting, we controlled the door in, door out. This is a very a crucial quality 
for the primary stroke center to know what is the door in the route. It is very different if it's below 60 minutes, or for example, if it's above, above two hours, it makes all the difference in some cases. Now, what is the power of these pre-hospital scales used by paramedics only? On, they were able to select a population of very severe stroke patients. On arrival to the first hospital, the NIH was 17 severe strokes. One in four had a hemorrhage, only 8% had a mimic, a stroke mimic, and two thirds of ischemic stroke had an LVO. Meaning that overall from all the candidates that we selected with the best tool that we have race, only one in two are potential candidates for thrombectomies. So we're making decisions towards favoring thrombectomies in a population in only half Per half of this population might be benefit directly from a thrombectomy. We might either do not have an effect or harm the other half of the population if we are using only race. And this is the best that we have. And I want you to understand this concept. We want to favor thrombectomy, but we might be harming. And in fact, look at this, the access to reperfusion treatment. It was much higher at the local, if initial transfer to the local stroke center, and the thrombectomy was 10% higher when patient was directly transferred to the comprehensive stroke center. Now, the access in time was also counterbalanced. Earlier TPA, if patients transfer to the primary stroke center, early thrombectomy, five, 55 minutes earlier, if patient is transferred to the comprehensive. And this is <coughs> the conclusion of our study. We were shocked when, or at least myself, when I observed that overall, the distribution of disability was exactly the same no matter what you do, either if you do the drip and ship or the, uh, or the mothership, right? <clears throat> and one of the reason is here. Look at the patient with a hemorrhagic stroke when they were transfer directly to a thrombectomy center, meaning the whole long transfer initially, their outcome was much worse. Obviously these patients, they do not benefit from a thrombectomy. And in fact, we are harming them, as you can see here again, especially in the first hours, because uh, two major things, significantly because these patients will have a higher rate of vomiting and uh, pneumonia, as you can see, severe pneumonias during a long transfer. And also because there's still also some kind of hematoma growth because it takes probably longer to stabilize the blood pressure. You can see that there is uh, some uh, higher rates of hematoma growth. So this is the typical, the perfect example to show that not all strokes benefit from measures oriented exclusively to boost or improve thrombectomies. So keep that in mind when you do your policies. Also, IVTPA, we need to remember that IVTPA works. When patients were transferred to a local stroke center and they received IVTPA, 200 of them had a confirmed LVO at the primary stroke center. By the time they arrived to the comprehensive, 20% of them recanalized. I never needed a thrombectomy. So also this is a factor that we need to keep in mind. And we know from a long time that the earlier we give IVTPA to our patients in the golden hour or the first, first 90 minutes, it's exponentially higher the rate of recanalization because the clot is younger, it's not compacted, it didn't grow over time and TPA works much better in terms of recanalization. If we give it at the primary stroke center, for example, in the very early, time window. Now, what if we could 100% confirm a presence of LVO at the pre-hospital level, even though eh, the difference is not favorable for the mothership, eh, even if we could confirm LVO patients. However, if we could separate those we can, who, are, who are candidates for IVTPA at the local stroke center, it makes all the sense to transfer them but it doesn't make sense to transfer patients with a confirmed LVO and contraindications for IVTPA to a local stroke center. So if we know in advance that the patient has a contraindication, 
eh, we should somehow favor or tend to favor the mothership protocol. <clears throat> so this has an implication on the time, on the access, on the EMS response. And what worked in terms of EMS response in our network is not necessarily true in others. Look at this. And from the, our race cut study, it looks like most of the patients would benefit from a thrombectomy capable center for the mothership. Yeah? They had a higher probability per, uh, of good outcome if they're a transfer to a thrombectomy capable center if EMS evaluates them after three and a half hours. However, during the character, because of the characteristics of our network, we, in our case, 70% of the patients were evaluated by EMS in the first two hours. And this is why we got these results. If our EMS or our distances would have made that most patients were evaluated after three hours, the results of our trial would have been completely different. And same happened with day at night. Okay? We assume that workflows work exactly the day, same at day at night, but no. During daytime in our, in our network, there is a lot, everything favors earlier administration of IVTPA at the local stroke center. And there is very little delay in the access to thrombectomy eh, when the patient goes through the local stroke center. However, during night, the workflows are much worse in the local stroke center. So there's almost no advantage in the access of IVTPA, and there's a clear disadvantage in the access to thrombectomy. So if we had do, done, performed our trial only at night, the difference or the results would have shown that we need to do the mothership. The mothership. However, in our, our conclusion was that we need to improve workflow, workflows at night in the local stroke centers in order to achieve similar results uh, as compared to daytime. I'm gonna go a little faster, but also here, according to the distance, it's not the same if you have the, your stroke very far away, more than two hours away from a comprehensive or within 60 minutes drive. Probably if you are the closest you are to the comprehensive stroke centers, it makes more sense to transfer, to mothership the patient to the comprehensive. If you are very far away, you should stabilize, get IVTPA at the local stroke center, and then eventually transfer your patient. And nowadays, you can have very nice maps with the ex expected time of arrival to the comprehensive, and based on that, take your decisions. And this is what we are doing. And if you're Performance at the, at the primary stroke center is quite good on a DDO time, a during the route time of 78 minutes. It's very, and then you get a difference in the access to EVT eh, of 56 minutes only. Very good workflows through, through, the, through the primary. And then the final difference is half of what we were mentioning before on the Stratis registry. And this is why in the Stratis, probably direct or mothership patients had better outcomes. The more you reduce the difference in the axis, the more equal looks the outcomes. And it, it means that you should go to the local stroke centers if you are able to have, or if they perform very well, if they have very low during the route times. So as I see it, the ambulance here should wait in the other ambulance. You perform everything very fast. You share your image. You give your IVTPA as fast as possible and work on DDO times below 60 minutes if possible. And then you do not repeat imaging and you send the patient directly to the angio suite. You work as if, as if this primary stroke center is an extension of your emergency room. And functionally, it is not in the same building, it is a few kilometers or miles away, but functionally, you're part of the same team and you share the information on real time. And when you have ambulances waiting at the door, you can dramatically reduce the door in door out time from 96 minutes to 45, only by making this ambulance wait at the door. So these, these are very nice results. What happened in our network since 2016, remember, the red rural area, non-metropolitan area, because we participated in RaceCAD, the centers participating in this comprehensive uh, 
uh, network uh, project, we were able to reduce these indicators, the door to image, the door, the door to needle time in these primary stroke centers, very similar to what you get in the comprehensive stroke center. The door in the round time over the years was reduced over almost 30 minutes, which is impressive. And as a result, look at this, the gap, the difference in the access to thrombectomy between rural and metropolitan areas progressively was reduced, especially when once we started the race cut trial. And not only because patients were included in race cut, because this is the whole thorn effect. When these centers, they feel they are part of a big project and they are monitored, they improve their, their outcomes. And almost now, nowadays, you have almost the same chances to receive a thrombectomy if you live in rural areas or of metropolitan areas. Remember in 2016, we performed 300 thrombectomies in 2021, over a thousand. And now the rate that was five per 100,000, we tripled it to 15 per 100,000. And we continue to increase year after year. We could have taken the decision to, based on our results, to favor a mothership because anyway, uh, the results are the same. And also, but what we didn't, first we looked at, the, at, at what happened if you still live in, in the city of Barcelona, you still have better outcomes that if you live in a non-urban area. So whatever you do, mothership or dripanship will never be the same as living around the corner, very close to a comprehensive stroke center. And this is why first we decided not to follow the mothership for all of them, eh, because these very expert centers, if they lose most of the strokes with patients, they will lose their appetite and their expertise and their motivation to treat patients. So instead, we are promoting drip and ship. We are promoting care in these hospitals. We ask them to reduce the during time below 60 minutes. We ask them to, to improve the workflows by switching to TNK if possible, by using same communication apps that share in real time all the information. And we created three new thrombectomy ready centers. We are uh, bringing closer to the population thrombectomy outside from the metropolitan area of Barcelona. So now all these geographical regions have a thrombectomy center in them closer to the population. And again, I think this is another way, as mentioned before, uh, to stress and under underline how important it is to work with EMS work with ERs people, work with the people in the city scan, in the under suite as a team, as a team, and to share information real time and motivate everybody in order to do, get the best results. And I leave it here and I stop sharing my slides. Marvelous. Thank you very much, Mark. And given my technical problems, also thank you to Sheila for her presentation earlier. Um, but we have now solved the technical problems. But the other thing that we have done is we have, um, uh, with such excellent content, we have run on beyond our planned finish time. So we're going to take a different approach to questions and answers. I'm afraid we don't have time for live questions and answers now, but we have got all your questions. And um, on behalf of the WSO, Gagana will uh, get answers for those and post them on the WSO website along with the recording of this session, which uh, there's such a lot of great content there, it may well be that you want to return and uh, linger over some of the, the great content in, in each of those three talks. Um, I think perhaps the abiding message from each of the three talks is the need for collaboration at a regional, national and international level, if we're going to rapidly, at the sort of rate that Delete was talking about, aim to double the uptake uh, of uh, thrombectomy around the world and address some of these major inequalities that's been, that have been highlighted in some of these talks. Uh, so I'm going to uh, draw things to a close here, except to reiterate my thanks to uh, Dilip, to Sheila and to Mark uh, for the marvellous content um, and the rousing chorus of my way. Um, and thank you for, for your attention and to draw your attention to the fact it will be recorded and available on the WSO website, along with the answers to your questions. And it remains for me just to thank you for your attention and to hand over to Sarah, who's going to close the session. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Martin, and thank you for your uh, moderation today. And, and just to reiterate uh, Martin's comments to all the speakers uh, for your amazing content. We did predict we would probably go over. Um, and as Martin said, the questions will be answered um, online. I just wanted to remind people to register for the next WSO Global Policy webinar, which will be focused on civil society's contributions to improving stroke treatment and care. And that's on the 28th of September at 1 p.m. CEST. And so uh, I'll draw the, the webinar to a close. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you again to the panelists and to Martin for chairing. So good day to you all. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.